seminar and and um, and posting it to, to social media. So if you know if you have you know any any concerns or problems with that, you just might want to log out. Um, so I think that's everything. Um, so Joe, why don't you introduce yourself, and then um, I will leave this slide on unless you have. Uh, a, a presentation I will unshare. So just let me know. Okay. Well, thanks, Lou. Yeah. So my name is Joe Reynolds. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so I am president and director of Save Coastal Wildlife. Save Coastal Wildlife is a fairly new organization. This is our third year. We're a nonprofit. Some of you might uh, be familiar with us as the Bayshore Watershed Council. Uh, that council, that watershed council, was an all volunteer group dedicated to cleaning up waters in Raritan Bay and Sand Hook Bay. And that group was around for about 20 years or so. Um, and we sort of morphed and evolved into a nonprofit so we could do more, not just along Raritan Bay and Sand Hook Bay, but also in, along the entire Jersey Shore from Raritan Bay down to Delaware Bay. So we do a lot of uh, cool things. We, we do a lot of education. We do um, a lot of citizen science and research. And I'll touch on that tonight. Tonight, I'm gonna be talking about spring. Spring is one of our favorite seasons uh, along the Jersey Shore at Safe Coastal Wildlife. There's so much going on. Uh, all these animals are on the move. They're migrating. They're all looking to, to breed. Um, and start a family. And so uh, I always like doing this, this topic, this conversation and doing this PowerPoint presentation to educate people about just how exciting spring is along the Jersey Shore. Because, you know, a lot of people go to the Jersey Shore and they go, you know, this past weekend, there were so many people down in Point Pleasant walking around on the boardwalk, um, but not a lot of people realize all the wildlife, all the biodiversity along the Jersey Shore during this time of year. So um, I'm going to talk about that now. I'm going to see if I could, uh, hopefully this will work. I'm going to see if I could share my screen and, um, and get this uh, going. Yeah, okay. So I think, can, can you guys see this slide over here? It says spring along the Jersey Shore. Luke, can you see that slide? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I can, I can, but I was on mute. Yeah, okay, good, okay. Just, just check it. Okay, so we're gonna start this uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna ask you if you, ha if you have any questions, uh, put it on chat. And um, if it's something really, really important, um, I'll try to answer it right away. Otherwise, I'll, I'll try to uh, save uh, your questions for after the presentation as we sort of speed this through. Okay, so. From the Great Beds Lighthouse in Raritan Bay, if you're familiar with um, the Raritan Yacht Club, you probably see this all the time out there in Raritan Bay. A little bit far to the east is the Sandy Hook Lighthouse near the tip of the Sandy Hook Peninsula. Go a little bit farther down the coast, it's the Barnicut Inlet Lighthouse near the Atlantic Ocean. Go a little bit farther all the way down to the end, uh, it's the Cape May Lighthouse sitting near Delaware Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. On Delaware Bay side, you got one of the most beautiful lighthouses in my opinion is the East Point Lighthouse along Delaware Bay. So what does this tell us? There's a lot of water along the Jersey Shore. From Raritan Bay down to Delaware Bay, there's well over 200 miles of tidal waters along the Jersey Shore. Oceans cover, if we uh, uh, spread that out a little bit, oceans cover about 71% of the planet. 97% of all that world's water is salt water. And yet people, we call this planet Earth, but you know what? There's not a lot of Earth on planet Earth. It's a blue planet. There's a lot of water on planet Earth. And yet we know more about the moon, Mars, and outer space than, outer space than we really do know about our own oceans. We've really only mapped out about 20% of the ocean floor. So if you think about that for a minute, we've mapped out the moon completely. We, we're in the process of mapping out Mars, and we've done a really good job of mapping out Mars. But when it comes to our own planet, the blue planet, we've only mapped out about 20% of the ocean floor. So if you're looking at this map right now and you're saying, wait a minute, Joe, that map of the ocean floor looks like it's completely mapped out. A lot of that is guesswork. So scientists were just saying, well, you know, maybe that's the way it is. But officially, we've only mapped out about 
of the ocean floor. So we know more about the moon and Mars than we do know about our own planet. We've only sent three people to explore the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench over there in the West Mariana Basin near the Philippine Sea. It's nearly seven miles deep. We've sent the first time humans descended into that deepest part of the ocean called Challenger Deep was more than 60 years ago. In 1960, Jacques, uh, Jacques Picard and Navy Lieutenant Don Welsh reached their goal in a US Navy submersible. And by the way, the fact that we don't know their names, many people don't know their names, but we know the first person that went to out, uh, outer space was Alan Shepard. The fact that we know that, but we don't know the these two gentlemen's names just shows you that we know more about outer space than we do know about the oceans and water. We sent another person down there to the deepest part of the ocean, Challenger Deep on March 26, 2012. You guys know this person, James Cameron, famous movie director. He has a lot of money and he built himself an all, his own submersible, went down to Challenger Deep to see what uh, was living at the bottom of the ocean. So again, we, we've sent over 500 people in outer space 12 people to the moon. So you might say, wait a minute, Joe, the deepest part of the ocean is really dangerous. Yeah, but so is outer space. And we've sent more people into outer space than we have to the bottom of the ocean. And the Jersey Shore, if we get back locally now, the Jersey Shore has a tremendous amount of life that few people really truly understand. Most people just see gulls and jellyfish and clams, and they think that's it. That's all that lives along the Jersey Shore. But you know, if, if you're you know if you're out boating or fishing, there's a lot more life along the Jersey Shore. We've got a tremendous amount of awesome, cool wildlife along the Jersey Shore. Tons of birds to see, uh, lots of fish. Whales are popping up now, dolphins and seals. We've got puffer fish. We have seahorses along the Jersey Shore. Um, I'm not gonna mention any names, but many years ago, there was a local uh, environmental commissioner in one of the local towns around Raritan Bay and Sandy Hook Bay. And he was telling me he was excited he was gonna go to Block Island to check out all the uh, wildlife up there. And I'm like, there's a tremendous amount of wildlife right here along the Jersey Shore. The only reason you're going to Block Island is see wildlife. You could just save your money, stay here along the Jersey Shore. Block Island's beautiful, but you know, there's a tremendous amount of life right here along the Jersey Shore that few people really get to see. So we got to expand our IQ of water. We've got to expand our IQ of the coast and our oceans. And so that's why Save Coastal Wildlife was born and created to educate people about the amazing biodiversity along the Jersey Shore. We do a lot of cool things. We monitor horseshoe crabs, we monitor ospreys, we install osprey platforms, we're doing that now. We monitor seal populations in the winter time. We also conduct uh, microplastic research to see the uh, negative impacts of plastic on our environment. We're uh, monitoring skates and we uh, whelk A cases. We're storing rib muscles. We do a lot of cool stuff. If you wanna know more about all the cool things we do, go to our website, safecoastalwildlife.org. If you're interested in helping us, you could sign up, get our email newsletter and become a volunteer and join us in many things we do to help to educate people and restore and do research about life along the Jersey Shore. So one of our favorite times along uh, the Jersey Shore at, for Save Coastal Wildlife is spring. Um, spring starts around the March equinox. That's when we get 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime. And there's only two times of the year that happens. That's in September for the fall equinox and then in spring, March for the spring equinox. As the earth rotates around the sun, it's tilted 23.4 degrees. Um, and now it's tilting, the Northern hemisphere is tor uh, tilting towards the sun. And this is why we're getting more daylight every single day. And so wildlife responds to that. As winter ends, saltwater wetlands and estuaries wait for the arrival of warm weather residents such as ospreys. It begins with the sun warming up the mud and the spring rains discharging nutrients into the water. And that produces vast populations of plankton. And if you remember, if you go back, you know, clear your mind, go back to the eighth grade. That's probably when you started learning about plankton, these small little microscopic critters, really, really important to all life along the Jersey Shore. Without plankton, there would be no life. Life in the ocean wouldn't exist. It would be a desert because all that plankton feeds fish, which feed larger fish, which feeds the ospreys and birds and, and even people as well too. It starts with that plankton. It's the backbone of a coastal food web. 
That's why we, we go out in the summertime, we look for plankton, we have a plankton net, we drag it through the water, seeing what type of plankton exists along the Jersey shore. We find lots of copepods, lots of cool stuff, lots of uh, plankton roaming around in our waters. And again, that's the backbone of, of, of a food web. Without plankton, you're not gonna get our food. You're not, you're not gonna get bigger fish. You're not gonna get birds. Um, you're not going to get the whales, you're not going to get the dolphins, and you're not going to get people out there looking for fish. Here's a gentleman right over here, uh, caught himself a nice striped bass, and this is striped bass season now. The striped bass are migrating up, they're coming up from Chesapeake Bay, and they're coming up to Raritan Bay. As the waters warm up, they're going to be coming in here and they're going to be laying eggs in Delaware Bay, but one of the major spots is up along the Hudson River, and at Raritan River, they're gonna be moving up there and spawning and starting the next generation of striped bass. So as the waters get warmer, the striped bass are moving up. I should point out that there is a permanent population of striped bass in our local waters here in Raritan Bay and up along the Hudson River. There's also a permanent striped bass population off the Jersey Shore and the ocean. So there's lots of things going on with striped bass, but one of the most exciting times of the year for striped bass is during its spring migration as it's coming up and the females are laying eggs and starting the next generation. So striped bass is important fish. I know a lot of people look forward to this time of year, getting out on the beach um, and getting the first striped bass of the season. Uh, usually around May is the height of striped bass uh, migration and spawning. That's when we get the, the big stripers coming in um, to lay those eggs. And of course we encourage people at, at Safe Coastal Wildlife to don't keep the females. So the bigger striped bass, the monster striped bass, those are gonna be the females. Those are gonna be the ones with the eggs. So take a picture of that, let them go, keep the males, keep the smaller striped bass, but let the bigger fish, the, big, the bigger striped bass, the females, let them go so they can keep the population healthy and happy. What's the striped bass feeding on? Well, they're gonna be feeding on menhaden and bunkers. So I talked about how important plankton is. Well, guess what? Menhaden is probably just as important as that plankton because menhaden is eating plankton and menhaden um, is, is an important fish. There's a book that came out several years ago calling menhaden the most important fish in the sea. Some of you might know this fish as bunker. That's another name for it. Moss bunker is another name as well too. This bunker where menhaden provides uh, an important source of food for lots of species. So menhaden eats the plankton and then menhaden gets eaten by ospreys, dolphins, whales, sharks, fish like bluefish and striped bass. So without menhaden, um, we're not gonna have the biodiversity. In fact, back in the bad old days along the Jersey shore, back in the 1970s and 80s, when the waters around here really polluted with raw sewage and water quality was so bad, there was oil uh, spills all over the place. Um, there wasn't a lot of menhaden, there wasn't a lot of life. Um, because of that, because we didn't have a lot of menhaden. So all this fish activity uh, in March and April is going to keep the seals around. So we have seals in Sandy Hook Bay and Raritan Bay. Some of you, maybe many of you probably have seen seals in our bay waters. Um, and so there are seals around here and um, they stick around usually to about April. Um, there's some that will stick around all year long. Usually the juveniles, the ones that are not sexually mature yet, they'll stick around all year long, a few of them. But most of the adults will leave by mid to 8 April, but they're going to stick around now to feed on that menhaden, to feed on all that fish activity. It's really cool. When I was a kid growing up, I didn't see any seals. It wasn't really until maybe about 10, 15 years ago. That I started, well, maybe about 15, 20 years ago that I started seeing my first seal along the Jersey Shore. But once I got to see my first seal, then more just kept on popping up all over the place. So, you know, we could see seals. Here's the Verrazano Bridge and there's a seal head popping up looking right at you. They're all over the place during the winter time. One of the most important places along the Jersey Shore to see seals and, and seals really count on these spots are seal haul out sites. So there's only a few of them in this area. And they're really important because this is where the seals come out to rest and relax and warm up their bodies and more importantly, digest their food. So seals don't chew their food. Yeah, they have sharp teeth, but they don't chew their food. They take out big chunks and they swallow it. And the stomach does most of their digestion. So they need to come out. They, they hunt, they forage for food at night. 
they come out most of the time during the daytime, during low tide on these haul out sites. And this is where they digest their food. So if people get too close, if boaters get too close, wind surfers get too close, uh, it's gonna scare the seals away. And if, if people scare them enough, they're, they're not gonna come back to that site anymore. They're gonna go someplace else. So we're monitoring seal populations around Sand Hook Bay to try to protect them, to make sure the, steals, the seals are sticking around, that people aren't harassing them too much. And as I mentioned, there's only a couple of places that these haul out sites exist. I mean, yeah, you could see seals anywhere along the Jersey Shore during the wintertime, but at these haul out sites, this is where you're gonna get 20, 30, 40, sometimes 100, sometimes 200 seals hanging out on these haul out sites to rest, warm up their bodies and digest their food. So around here, we're kind of lucky. We have like two or three of them, Swinburne and Hoffman Island. Some of you might know that, that is south of the Verrazano Bridge near um, the eastern end of Staten Island. There's a couple of man-made islands there called Swinburne and Hoffman. That's where you could see seals haul out during the winter time. And then also in Sand Hook Bay, there's Skeleton, uh, Skeleton Hill Island. That's another spot to see seals as well as some other spots in Sand Hook Bay. Then you got to go all the way down to Tuckerton to Great Bay Estuary. And there's another seal haul, uh, seal haul out site over there. All these are fairly well protected, but the problem is um, people, boaters and whatnot are gonna get too close. Um, there's this misconception that seals eat a lot of fish, um, which is just not true. Um, people, if you think about how much fish people take out with our nets and how much bycatch there is, there's far more waste, uh, far more fish taking out from that than there is just one or two seals or a hundred seals or a thousand seals eating uh, in our area. So we're trying to educate people about seals and trying to protect our seal population because they won't stick around for long if we don't try to protect them. And they're really cool to watch. Sometimes you might get to see them. They make this really cool banana pose um, as they're resting and relaxing around the bay. So they're fun to watch, no doubt about it. Everybody likes to see marine mammals. And then this time of year, spring, March, um, end of March, early April, usually the first couple of weeks of April, we got huge populations of gannets, a really beautiful bird. They nest up in Canada, up on the islands, the rocky islands in Canada, but they come here along the Jersey shore and sometimes in huge flocks of, it could be a thousand birds, a thousand flocks of Northern gannets and they're feeding on the bait fish. They're feeding on herring and, and small fish like that. And what's really cool about them when you watch them, they dive head first into the water. 30 feet, 40 feet, sometimes 100 feet high into the sky, and they're diving head first into the water to catch a fish. So this is the time to really go out to the bay. Uh, there was a nice uh, uh, flock of uh, gannets uh, this past weekend feeding around the area, and that's gonna happen for the next couple of weeks. So go out now and, and look for those gannets. It's really a spectacular show. It's one of those hidden gems people don't realize. They might've heard about Northern gannets. They might've seen Northern gannets on a video TV show, but they don't realize that right here along the Jersey shore from Sand Hook Bay, Raritan Bay, on down to Delaware Bay, you could see these beautiful uh, birds catching fish now before they head up north to raise a family up in Canada. What are they feeding on? Small fish, herring. The herring are coming in now. All winter long, they've been out in the ocean. Now they're coming into our estuaries. They're gonna move up on our rivers. They're gonna spawn, they're gonna lay eggs. Um, and they have, to got, they have to go past this gauntlet of not just hungry birds, seabirds, but also striped bass, bluefish, uh, seals. So uh, they've got to go through this, this maze to get up to their spawning grounds up along the Hudson River and Raritan River. And then there's another fish eating bird that doesn't go up to Canada necessarily to, to, to spawn. It spends its time right here along the Jersey shore. It's an osprey or a fish hawk, really beautiful bird. Their population's coming back now, uh, save close to wildlife, the nonprofit I'm part of. We're trying to do our part to bring back the osprey. It's a bird where 99% of its diet is dependent on fresh fish. They don't eat dead animals. Um, and they don't eat really too much else. Sometimes they might eat a snake or something, but most of the time they're just gonna eat fresh fish. And so they, they tend to be an indicator species. When you have lots of ospreys raising lots of young, that means your fish population's doing really well and your water quality's doing really well. 
Here's a big word for you guys, monogamous. Anybody know what monogamous means? It means people stay together for forever, for a long time. People are not so good at being monogamous. <laughs> but ospreys, ospreys tend to be really good at being monogamous. Why is that? Maybe we can learn something about ospreys and marriage. Ospreys take separate vacations during the winter time. So <laughs> four, five, six months out of the year, they're not living together. Uh, they're going their separate ways. And so some of them are down in all the way far south as South America, in Brazil and Venezuela. Some of them not so far, maybe Florida, but they come back usually, usually around the same day or so after St. Patrick's Day, the same nest location. If that nest location was destroyed by a winter storm, then they look for a, a nest nearby uh, and build a new home for their family. So ospreys are these amazing birds. Uh, we love to see it's the arrival of spring when ospreys come around. And if they're producing two or three young, that means water, uh, water quality is really good. Around here, most of the ospreys just produce one, one young, maybe two, um, but we want to get that population up to three as they do in Chesapeake Bay um, and other spots. Uh, that would mean water quality is doing really well. So right now our osprey population is producing one to two, but we like to get up to two to three. And as because of sea level rise and overdevelopment along the coast, there's really not many good places for ospreys to nest. And so we're putting up osprey platforms. We did this a couple of weeks ago with people from Bergen County Parks. Hopefully you guys can see this video. This is a really cool video that Bergen County Parks made. We worked together with them to put up this osprey platform. So I'd like to give a shout out to Frank Huza and Ron Dente. They're the, our lead Osprey platform makers. They do a wonderful job of putting all the uh, materials together to make uh, an Osprey platform. It's a lot of work, really the, the, most, uh, the, the most tedious work is getting all that material out into the middle of the wetlands to put it up. But these guys build most of the platform ahead of time. And so we're done, we're, we're done like in an hour. It takes us an hour to put up that platform and we're out. Um, and then soon after the osprey start coming back and putting in sticks and branches and building a nest and, and raising a, a family uh, for the summertime along the Jersey shore. And then another bird that comes back, a smaller bird that comes back is the piping plover. Uh, they're mainly along the Jersey shore on the ocean side. They travel over a thousand miles from the Bahamas, many of them to come to New Jersey every spring to raise their family. It's a long migration. Sometimes when you first see them as they arrive along the Jersey Shore, they look a little ragged. They look a little messed up. Uh, they got to clean themselves and preen themselves to get a little nicer looking. And, and then they start looking around for some food. They're really hungry as they made that migration. It's a small bird. It's only about the, the size of your hand. That's how small that bird is. Unfortunately, their population's going down due to habitat loss. And there's just a lot of uh, predators now along the beaches because there's so much trash and garbage. So lots of foxes and crows and things like that and gulls that can do damage to uh, 
uh, to, to piping plover nests. And then one of the greatest things of springtime is hearing the mating call of a piping plover. Let's, so turn up your volume a little bit to hear this. It's a little low, so turn up your volume. It's a little low, but you could always Google it, <laughs> call it the piping plover and you could hear it. Uh, but it's a beautiful sound, it's a wonderful sound. So when you're walking along the Jersey Shore uh, in places like Sandy Hook or Island Beach State Park or down to Cape May, you might hear that sound and say, what is that? That is the mating call of a piping plover. And so they're usually solitary when they're feeding. Uh, they're looking for little uh, crabs and clams and, and little insects as well, too, to, to eat and to, to, to give them energy to raise a family. And as I mentioned before, it's, a, it's an endangered species here in New Jersey. Their population isn't doing that well uh, along the coast here, along the Jersey Shore. And so there are volunteers, people, organizations that put up these rope fences along the coast to give habitat for nesting shorebirds, not just for piping plovers, but for terns and uh, other birds as well too, like black skimmers. So we've got to learn to share the beaches with the birds, which is not always easy to do because during the summertime when it gets really hot, like in July and August, there are so many people along our beaches. It can be difficult to share our coastline with small birds. Um, and these piping plover eggs blend in so well. So if there's no protection for them, you might be walking your dog along the coast and not realize there is a piping plover nest there. Um, and so we've got to do a better job of protecting these birds because as the piping plover eggs hatch, literally you have a small little piping plover about the size of a cotton ball with, uh, with legs walking up and down the coast. What's amazing about many of these shorebirds is the parents let these birds roam free along the coast looking for their own food. So not, it's unlike robins that mother robin might give like a worm to the young birds to feed. These birds are on their own looking for their own food pretty much as soon as they, um, as they hatch out of the, the eggs. Now the parents are nearby to look after the young, but basically these, you have little cotton balls with legs running around looking for food. And so they hatch in May, the birds are gonna grow up soon by August, they're gonna be out of here. They're gonna be flying back down to the Bahamas and back down to the tropics to spend the winter time here. So they don't spend that much time, but it's really important the time they do spend here to raise that family. From a small bird, one of the smallest birds along the Jersey Shore, we get to one of the tallest birds along the Jersey Shore, and that is the great blue heron, about four feet tall. And so it's a tall bird, but they still nest in trees, just like a lot of other birds do. There's these rookeries along the Jersey Shore, and we don't realize it, but here in Raritan Bay and Sandy Hill, uh, Sandy Hill Bay, not far from the Raritan Yacht Club, there are some important uh, rookeries over there where these herons and egrets and other wading birds are nesting. And so first observed by New York City Audubon many, many, many years ago, there is, I mentioned before, Swinburne and Hoffman Islands off of Staten Island, south of the Verrazano Bridge during the wintertime, that's when seals will haul out. Well, during the spring and summer, that's where herons and egrets nest. And that is an important nesting area for those wading birds. So these birds are very sensitive to people. When people get too near, they're gonna leave. And so what's nice about these islands is that people get, can't get too near to their nests. So they feel very safe there and they could raise a family. But what's cool is that these birds are gonna come south. They're gonna come here to New Jersey. They're gonna come along the Jersey shore to places like Sandy Hook. They're gonna come to places like uh, uh, Compton's Creek and Pews Creek, Union Beach over Conestock Point and over at Cheesequake State Park. This is where they feed. And they bring that food back up to Hoffman and Swinburne Islands for the young. So when you're looking around, when you're walking along the Jersey Shore, especially the northern part of the Jersey Shore, and you see a great blue heron, um, and you're seeing snow egrets and great egrets, or even a tricolored heron, or one of my favorite wading birds, the glossy ibis, and you're saying, wow, where do these birds nest? Well, they might be nesting up in New York Harbor. Good chance is they're probably nesting up in New York Harbor. Yeah, there are a few um, rookeries, a few nesting areas around here. Um, and of course, a lot more down south. But here in the Raritan Bay and Sandy Hook Bay, most of them are nesting around New York Harbor, on islands around New York Harbor. 
And then we got terns as well too. A lot of people confuse these birds with gulls, but they're not, they're more elegant. And just like those gannets that dive head first in the water, the same is true for the terns. We have two types of terns here, uh, uh, the common tern, which as its name calls, it's pretty common. And then the least tern, which is a small little tern and it's an endangered species along the Jersey shore. Um, we're losing its habitat. It likes to nest in, in many of the same places the piping plover likes to nest. And because there's so many predators coming in because there's so much trash along the beach. So it attracts gulls and crows and rats and, and foxes. It's, it's munching on the eggs of least terns as well. But as I mentioned before, terns, it's amazing. When you see these terns feeding in the water, you know there's a large group of fish, bait fish. Um, it could be small little um, menhaden, it could be um, uh, silver sides or whatever, but there's a, a school of fish, a large school of fish, and these birds are diving headfirst into the water to catch that fish. It's an amazing thing when you watch that. And now springtime, they're coming back April and they're gonna catch fish. And they do this little mating ritual where a turn is, uh, a male turn is gonna catch a fish to bring to the female to prove that he is worthy that he could, he could bring food to the family. So there you go, there's a male least turn bringing a fish to the female to say, hey, I'm worthy, I'm worthy to be your mate. I could bring, I could be a good provider and, and bring food for the family. So it's really, it's really an amazing sight to watch this. And then one of our favorite times here along uh, the Jersey shore for Save Coast to Wildlife is horseshoe crab spawning. So in May and June, full moon and new moon evenings, we're out, Save Coast to Wildlife, members of Save Coast to Wildlife are out counting crabs, monitoring the population. Unfortunately, the population's going down um, because New York State still harvests lots of crabs for bait. Uh, but horseshoe crabs have been around for a long time, over 400 million years. It's a living fossil. They haven't really changed all that much in 400 million years. They've been around when the dinosaurs were around and they survived. And yet now the population's going down because we're taking too much of these horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs, the females are larger than the males uh, because the, horseshoe, the female horseshoe crabs uh, carry the eggs. And so you could always tell the difference between male and female horseshoe crabs. Here's a female, here's a male, and then here's a brick uh, to sort of compare and contrast between all of them. So uh, springtime's great. May and June are nice. The horseshoe crabs are out. We're finding them. Um, there's a female in the center of this group of horseshoe crabs. And you have a bunch of males fighting for the attraction of that one female. And we're finding there's few females, but a whole bunch of males. So there's not many females uh, horseshoe crabs. That population is going down a lot. And that's because people who um, catch horseshoe crabs for bait tend to catch a lot of the females because they're bigger and they carry the eggs, which is an added bonus for bait. So here's those horseshoe crab eggs, small little pea-shaped eggs. Soon enough, uh, those eggs will hatch in about two weeks and we're gonna get baby little horseshoe crabs. So horseshoe crabs are using bait for eels and whelks. We don't really eat too many eels and whelks in this country, a little bit, but not much. But over in um, Asia, Japan, China, and over in Europe, they eat a lot more. So horseshoe crabs are being used for bait to catch eels and whelks for this international market for, uh, for fish over in Asia and in Europe. So in New York State, they, they harvest well over 200,000 crabs every year. A good chunk of that's taken out of uh, New York Harbor, Raritan Bay, and then sold on the open market. Some of that's also sold for medicinal purposes up in um, Massachusetts. So there's a lot going on with horseshoe crabs, and that's why we're out on new moon and full moon evenings to count horseshoe crabs, to see how the population is doing. I can tell you the population is not doing all that well, but that, we've been doing this now for over 10 years, monitoring horseshoe crabs. So join us if you like. Again, you can go to our website and help us to monitor horseshoe crabs around Sand Hip Bay and Raritan Bay. And then one of the great things about horseshoe crabs is they attract lots of migratory uh, shorebirds. These are birds that are coming from South America. They're coming from the tropics. They're stopping here in New Jersey to feed on horseshoe crab eggs. They've got to go all the way north to lay their eggs and start a family up in the Arctic. 
So New Jersey is a really important stopover point for red knots, sanderlings, dunlings, ruddy turnstones, sandpipers, lots of them. They come here to our, uh, to our local waters to feed on these horseshoe crabs. Uh, horseshoe crab eggs. If there's not a lot of eggs, this is one reason why we don't get a lot of shorebirds here. A lot of them go down to Delaware Bay. But a long time ago, we used to have lots of horseshoe crabs and lots of shorebirds. So we're trying to bring them back. One important shorebird is the red knot. This bird is totally dependent on horseshoe crab eggs. They really don't eat much else this time of year in the spring. And so as the horseshoe crab population is going down, so too is the red knot population. They travel over 9,000 miles from Terra del Fuego, from Patagonia, all the way up to Brazil, take a little break, then they travel all the way up to Delaware Bay in New Jersey. Then they take a little rest, feed on horseshoe crab eggs, fatten up, and then go all the way up to the Arctic to lay their eggs up on the tundra. Nine, over 9,000 miles, incredible journey. And if they don't get enough food, if they don't get enough horseshoe crab eggs, they literally just die of exhaustion. And this is why the population's not doing so well. Uh, there's just not enough food for these birds, these shorebirds, for red knots and dunlings and sanderlings. And this is one reason why shorebird populations are doing so poorly, uh, not just along the Jersey Shore, but, but in lots of other places. Spring is one of the best time when you're walking along the beaches to look for these treasures. This, the winter storms have washed up lots of sh uh, sea life. Um, spring is a great time to look for shells because in the summertime, lots of these beaches, the towns will rake the beaches to get rid of the trash. But as they do that, they also get rid of lots of these sea treasures. So go out now in spring after the winter storms, great time looking for shells. One of my favorite shells to look for are shells, clam shells with holes in them. They make nice, nice necklaces for the kids. You can draw on them and do different things. Who made that hole in the shell? It was a moon snail. They have a sharp, sticky tongue. They drill a hole in there, put a little acid, drill a hole in there, and suck the meat right out of that clam shell. So whenever you find a hole in a clam shell, perfect circle, it is always, always made by a snail. Sometimes it's made by a knob whelk. That's a snail as well, too. That's our state shell of New Jersey. A lot of people don't realize that. We do have a state shell. It is the knobbed whelk. And these knob whelks and whelks make these wonderful, beautiful egg cases. Some people think it's seaweed or it's something else, like a snake skin. But no, it's egg cases from whelks. Um, and inside each one of those little tiny egg case capsules can be anywhere from one to 100 tiny little whelks. And when whelks are born, they're born with their shell and that shell grows with them. So as they come out of those egg capsules, it's a tiny little whelk with a tiny little shell that grows bigger and bigger and bigger. We're also looking for skate egg cases. They're really cool. We're trying to find out, is there like an important breeding area or spawning area for skates? Skates are related to rays and sharks, but unlike rays, rays give birth to live young, skates produce these egg cases, almost like a chicken laying an egg. These egg cases will float in the water for several months until eventually out pops a little skate. And so we're trying to figure out here at Safe Coastal Wildlife, where are the important breeding areas for skate? One of the most common skates we have is the little skate. It grows about two feet in length. And here's what one looks like uh, live. You, sometimes when you're swimming in the Atlantic Ocean, you might come out with um, some blood on your ankles. And that probably means you're swimming near a skate because skates, they don't have poisonous tails, but they do have sharp tails. And so when you scare a skate, you might have uh, gotten close to that tail. And sometimes when you're swimming in the water, uh, if you get some blood on your ankle, that means you're swimming with a skate. Which to us, it's safe close to wildlife. That's luck. That's good luck. So that's a good thing for us. Sea stars are also really cool. We don't call them starfish because they're not true fish. They don't have eyes. They don't really have brains. They don't swim. So we call them sea stars. And so after a, a big storm is one of your best chances to find sea stars along the Jersey Shore. And then also too, you might find molts of horseshoe crabs. Some people think these are dead horseshoe crabs, but they're not. As horseshoe crabs get bigger and bigger and bigger, they molt out of their old shell and grow a new shell. And so these are really cool finds uh, to locate along the Jersey Shore in the springtime. And then also spring, as the waters get warmer, usually above 55 degrees is when we start getting dolphins coming back along the Jersey Shore. Cape May is one of the best places to see dolphins, but also you could see them along Barnegat Bay. 
and up here along uh, the northern part of the Jersey Shore, even into the Navasink River and Raritan Bay. Just every summer, there are dolphins in Raritan Bay, Sandy Hook Bay, and the Navasink River. On the ocean side, there's always dolphins, striped dolphins, common dolphins. Uh, but on the estuary side, the bay side, you're going to see bottlenose dolphins. Sometimes when you're lucky, you might be kayaking with some bottlenose dolphins in Sand Hook Bay or uh, the Navasink River. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Cape May is, is an important area for bottlenose dolphins. That's where they give birth in, in Cape May and Delaware Bay. So you can go down there, you could hop on board a boat, um, and you could see anywhere from 50 to 100 to, to more than 100 dolphins swimming around. Um, and not only adults, but little baby dolphins as well, too. You got humpback whales now along the Jersey Shore. They're coming back. You could see just about um, any type of any time of year humpback whales, but spring, summer, and fall tends to be a, a really important time for them. This is when they're feeding. We get a lot of juvenile whales here along the Jersey Shore because uh, there's food for them, and they don't have to compete with that food for the adults as they do up in New England. Massachusetts and Canada. So the whales that we see, most of the whales that we see, well over 90% of the whales that we see are humpback whales. And a lot of those whales uh, tend to be juvenile humpback whales that are feeding. And what are they feeding on? Guess what? <laughs> They're feeding on Menhaden and Bunker. Uh, so if you have lots of Menhaden and Bunker, you're gonna have lots of whales, you're gonna have lots of dolphins, you're gonna have lots of life. It all comes back to that small little bait fish, comes back to the plankton, really, really important for a healthy ecosystem. We don't want to litter our waters. We don't want to go back to the bad old days to the 1960s and 70s. Um, I remember as a kid growing up along the Jersey Shore, I grew up in Long Beach Island, moved up here in Monmouth County when I graduated from college. And I remember the water quality was really so bad um, that you know, as kids, we would call all the trash in the water and there was just so much trash and so much oil, uh, we would call them sea monsters because they were just black and disgusting and just gross. Thankfully, we don't have any sea monsters anymore, but we still have lots of trash and we've got to do a better job of cleaning up our waters. Our waters are cleaner than they were during the 1970s, but they're not clean. There's still more work to be done to clean up our waters. And one of the things we're really worried about now is plastics. All those plastics that we've been using since the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and we've been using a lot of plastics and more now, they're all breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics. So this is one reason why we're studying uh, microplastics along the Jersey Shore to see what type of impact it's having to life. And I can tell you right now, uh, a lot of that microplastics is getting into the sea life. It's getting into the fish, it's getting the seabirds, um, and, and what kind of impact that's having to those species is still yet to be determined, but there is a lot of plastic, microplastic along the Jersey Shore. So again, join us if you can, get outside, um, expand your IQ of biodiversity along the Jersey Shore, expand your IQ about water, uh, because we live here in a coastal state, Monmouth County, Middlesex County is coastal counties. You have a coastline. And yet a lot of people don't realize all the wonderful life that lives along the Jersey Shore and all the threats and uh, all the ways to protect, we need to protect these animals. So join us if you can, Save Coastal Wildlife, www.savecoastalwildlife.org, go to our website, join us for uh, one of our many uh, volunteer citizen science projects. Um, and I think that is it. I wanna thank Paul and the Raritan Yacht Club folks for inviting me to talk about spring along the Jersey Shore. And I apologize if I didn't get to your favorite animal, your favorite spring animal along the Jersey Shore. Uh, we'll say that for another time. We're always updating this uh, PowerPoint presentation. So maybe we'll get to your favorite animal another time. But I'm gonna stop here and see if anybody had any questions, comments, suggestions, criticisms. I'll take it all right now. You have to stop your screen share, Joe. We've got a couple words okay. Paul's going to say. So I'd, I'd like to just thank Joe and Save Coastal Wildlife for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, a really great presentation. A lot of information about what's going on here in Raritan Bay uh, in, on the Jersey Shore. I can tell you, I didn't realize that there was that many places to see some of the wildlife that you're talking about, Joe. So thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Um, Really, really great job. Uh, while, while we take a break and we sort of just go through some of the questions that are in the uh, chat room, we wanted just to, to 
talk about RYC. A lot of folks that are on the call here don't really know too much about us or may, may only be following us online. So just want to share with you a few things about RYC. We're located in Perth Amboy. We trace our roots back to 1865, been around for quite some time. Uh, we're, we're a sailing club year round, uh, you know, whether it's winter, spring, summer, fall, we're always out there on the water. Uh, on Wednesday nights in the spring and summer, we're out there uh, racing. Uh, our members are out sailing Raritan Bay, Jersey Shore, uh, Long Island throughout the summer. Uh, we have shared boat programs, so you don't have to, you know, own a boat to be a part of RYC or to get out and go sailing. We have a lot of different education programs. So, for example, you just want to try out sailing contact us you know we have a way to you know get you out there you can see what sailing's about and see if it makes sense um various different other programs women's sailing summer sailing for uh juniors uh if you want to get sailing certifications right we're here we have plenty of things that we can go with you on and then as i said we're year-round sailing so uh when most folks are starting to uh you know start the fireplaces in their homes and kick up the heat we're heading out there sailing on uh, Sundays and Saturdays uh, with our frostbiting program. And then when it's really cold, January, February, March, we're actually out there uh, racing remote control lasers. So uh, if you ever want to learn more about sailing or are interested, uh, feel free to look us up. Um, Lou, if you could flip to the next slide. And we do have a few more events that are coming up. So uh, at the Towards the end of next month, we're going to have a uh, seminar about uh, marine weather, uh, marine weather and current data. So, you know, kind of working off of what we were talking about here, you know, what's going on in the, with weather, how can you predict it a little bit better, what are the tools that are out there, and then what's going on with the currents. Um, we also have a program about learning how to run a race committee. So. For folks that are interested in learning about sailing and how the races work, we have a session out there. And you know, get ready to come sailing. Uh, if you if you don't follow us on Facebook, follow us on Facebook. Uh, there's various different links there, so you can start getting to uh, involved in our racing program. It's a great way to learn about, about sailing. A lot of folks that are on there have never sailed before, and they get on a race crew, and within a year or two, they're able to sail their own boat. So, you know, look forward to seeing you there. Okay, Luke, um, could, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, jump, jump to the next slide. Okay, did you want to do questions and answers first or no? Uh, yeah, we could do that. Okay, uh, Adam, if you wanted to go through the chat window uh, and, and go through some of the questions. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted me to just read out the questions or if Joe saw some that he thought would be interesting um, to answer. Your choice, Joe. Um, I mean, there was two really good questions that I saw. Uh, one asked uh, the gentleman, or somebody asked me, I forget, I apologize. Uh, somebody asked me about where do uh, ospreys, if there wasn't man-made platforms, or artificial nesting platforms, where would these ospreys nest? A really good question. People often ask me that. Um, and so ospreys, their natural habitat to nest is out in the open on dead trees. Uh, but because of sea level rise and because of the overdevelopment of our coastline, we really lost a lot of the maritime forest. We lost a lot of our coastal trees. We don't have really many dead trees around, around the coast or in our wetlands anymore. Since the reason why many decades ago, uh, volunteers really started on Long Island. Volunteers started putting up these uh, man-made or artificial platforms to bring back the osprey platform, or bring back the ospreys. And those platforms worked um, and people have been doing it ever since. But every, every once in a while you might see like down in, in Delaware Bay and South Jersey, uh, there are still lots of forests, and so every once in a while you'll be driving around and you'll see an osprey nest in a tree, in a dead tree. Um, so they're still around, but up here in this area, uh, we have so much development. Uh, we just need to put up the osprey platforms to get those ospreys back here in this area. Um, and then there was another good question about uh, dead fish along the shore. Um, and, and so uh, most of the dead fish that wash up along the Jersey Shore are the menhaden. Um, so there's lots of reasons why they might wash up dead. Uh, a big reason is, uh, well, it, it could be low dissolved oxygen. So 
um, as the, the menhaden get into these huge schools um, uh, because the predators will drive them towards the coastline to easily feed on them. They, they lose oxygen, they wash up dead along the coast. Uh, some of that could be natural. So if you remember the story about native people, indigenous people, the native Americans who would use fish as a fertilizer to grow their corn, that came from the menhaden. So they would look for made hen, you know, dead fish along the coast and use that as fertilizer. So some of that is natural, but now it's happening more often than not. Um, and, and some of that is due to diseases in the water that's impacting menhaden due to poor water quality. Um, and then some of that also too is just, um, it's just dirty water that's impacting um, the menhaden population. Um, so that's two questions I thought were really good. Um, and, and, and hence the reason why we need to do a better job of cleaning up our waters. Um, there's still a lot more work to be done. We, Joe, we saw a question earlier about uh, red knot populations, if you have any comments on that. Uh, sure, so red knots, we don't get too many red knots up here along the Jersey, uh, up the Northern part of the Jersey shore lot more down South Jersey. So you need to have a lot of horseshoe crabs. So these birds, these uh, migratory shorebirds, they don't dig in the sand to get to the eggs, right? So if you have lots of horseshoe crabs, they're gonna lay lots of eggs and some of those eggs are not gonna get buried into the sand. And so that's food for the migratory shorebirds. So when you have lots of horseshoe crabs, you're gonna get lots of shorebirds. Here, because we don't have that many horseshoe crabs, we don't get a lot of shorebirds like red knots. We get a few uh, in May, you know, you're always gonna see a few up around the tip of Sandy Hook or maybe over Conestant Point and Union Beach or maybe a few other places. Um, but by and large, South Jersey, Delaware Bay is where they get most of the shorebird activity because that's where they have a lot more horseshoe crabs than us. That's not to say that their population is doing all that well in South Jersey. Their horseshoe crab population is also uh, not doing that well. Um, but they have a lot more than us up here. And when we think about oysters in the bay, how, what's their relationship? So oysters, when I think of oysters, I think the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, that's the main organization that's trying to bring back the oyster population. They've been working on that for well over 20 years. Lots of issues, lots of problems, but oysters are this amazing bivalve. So you, some of you might have a fish tank at home. If you have a fish tank at home, you probably have a filter in your fish tank to clean up that water to make sure that it doesn't get dirty and gross so the fish are happy and healthy, right? But out in the bay, what is there? There's not a mechanical filter, but there are oysters. One single oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. So imagine if you had a million oysters or a billion oysters or 10 billion oysters. Think about how much cleaner the water would be, right? So that's what organizations like the New York, New Jersey Harbor, as uh, the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, I should say, are trying to do is to bring back the oyster population. Um, and not only that, but oysters create these wonderful reefs, like coral reefs. We don't have coral that make reefs up here, but we used to have oysters that made reefs. And these reefs were important habitat for fish and for crabs and for worms and different things. So by bringing back the oysters, we could bring back a really important source of of uh, natural cleaning to the bay and also really important habitat. Uh, but it's hard to do because um, there is lots of pollution in the water still that's impacting our oyster population and lots of other things going on as well too. So it's not an easy task. That's why at Safe Coast to Wildlife, we're trying to restore our muscle population, our rib muscle population. The rib muscles, they're not as great uh, at filtering, uh, filtering water. They can filter like 10 to 15 gallons of water, uh, a single muscle but we're also losing our rib muscle population because of sea level rise and more intense storms. And we think by bringing back the muscle population, it will help to bring back the oyster population as well to help to clean up the water a little bit. Um, so everything's connected and, and we're trying to do what we can to tr uh, clean up our waters. That's great. Another question from Adam Morris was, how can we get involved in the citizen science projects or conservation activities would signing up for the newsletter be the best way? Yeah, absolutely. So let me just stop and say, we're not the only organization out there. I don't wanna be greedy. There are other organizations you could join as well too. Um, but we do a lot, we do, we have a lot of fun doing it. I think we're probably the organization that has the most fun doing that. So I'll throw that out there. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But uh, yeah, Save Coastal Wildlife, 
Uh, we do a lot of cool things. And so sign up for our email, our email newsletters, our emails, all the volunteer information comes out via email. Sometimes we put it on Facebook, but now with COVID, we do everything pre-registration. So if you wanna join us for monitoring horseshoe crabs or seals or ospreys, you have to pre-register uh, to be a volunteer or be a citizen science. Uh, citizen scientists. So please sign up for our email newsletter. You'll get all the information on how to join us, meet some great people, and, and learn more about your coastal environment and help these animals as well too. Um, and that's, that's really, I think to me, that's really the core of good citizen science and good education. When you do something hands-on that educates people and also does something wonderful for the environment. And along those lines, can you think of some ways that maybe small changes people can make in their everyday lives to help save the wildlife, even if it's diverting microplastics or avoiding re balloon releases and things like that. Yeah, so I mean, plastics and balloons are, are probably the two things that are really doing damage to our water quality right now. Um, yeah, so if you, could, if you could cut down on the amount of plastics or just properly throw away your trash, um, you know, I, I think there was the other day I was walking along the beach and there was just so much plastic bottles and bottle caps all over the place and plastic bags. So if you could just properly throw away your trash, if you see somebody doing something nasty, you know, just tell them, you know, please throw away your trash or, you know, volunteer to be part of the beach cleanups. Clean Ocean Action is going to have their beach sweeps uh, uh, next month be part of that. We're also doing some beach cleanups along the Jersey Shore. We're doing a, a microplastic uh, beach cleanup at Plum Island at Sandy Hook for Earth Day. Uh, I think on uh, the 25th, I wanna say somewhere around there, we're also gonna be down in Asbury Park in May. So be part of the cleanups and then balloons are really nasty. Please don't release balloons. <laughs> it's so nasty. Those balloons just travel far. And because planet Earth doesn't have a lot of Earth, it's mostly a blue planet. Guess where those balloons wind up? In the water. Um, there was a really good study done by um, Boston University students. They spent a summer on Cape Cod, right? Great, great, great research project for them. They spent a, a summer on Cape Cod. Uh, this is about 10 or 15 years ago, examining all the dead marine mammals that washed up along Cape Cod. And what they found is nearly all those marine mammals that washed up dead on Cape Cod that summer had plastics inside their stomach. And that was one of the main reasons they died was because of the plastics in their summer. Plastic bottle caps, plastic bags, bits and pieces of plastic. So it's impacting the wildlife. Um, it's impacting not just whales, but seals, dolphins, seabirds. Um, it's impacting a lot of our coastal wildlife. So plastics, balloons, uh, they're really nasty. And so anything you do to, to limit that and, and to get rid of it would be wonderful. You know, oftentimes you see stories of animals that get entangled in trash and as boaters were out on the water so I wonder if you have comments on if there's a way to help an injured animal or a way to report it or if there's nothing to be done. Well there's always something to be done so if you're seeing an injured marine mammal uh, you can call them marine mammal um, oh was it marine mammal stranding center down in Brigantine uh, they cover all the entire Jersey Shore and uh, they will come up and rescue that seal, dolphin, whale, um, especially if it's a small whale. Um, they'll come up and, and try to rescue that animal. If it's a sea turtle, there's another organization that rescues those uh, animals as well too. Um, you can contact your local police. They should have those numbers of the rescue place, of, of, the, of the rescue organizations. Um, it's kind of hard with seabirds. There's not that many places that really rescue seabirds. Um, but there is a couple of them. There is, if you actually, if you go to the Safe Coastal Wildlife website, we have a whole list. If you look under um, how to how to save uh, wildlife, how to help wildlife, there is a list of all the organizations that that will take in seabirds, that will take in turtles, that will take in uh, all different types of animals that help those animals. Uh, we don't do that ourselves. It takes permits um, and and a lot of time to, to to become a professional to save these animals. But there are lots of wonderful organizations along the Jersey Shore that do that. And so we encourage you, if you do find an injured animal, uh, whether it be a turtle, a sea turtle or a diamondback terrapin, to, to seek out help for that animal. Because lots of these animals, their populations going down. So by just saving one, especially a female, um, it does a lot to increase the population of, of that uh, species. 
Hey, one, one last, there was one last question that came up. We saw some press today about uh, offshore wind generation in the New York, New Jersey area. I was wondering if that's going to have an impact on the wildlife. You know, it's, it's a really good question. I get that uh, constantly. A lot of people ask me about that. And I, I just, I don't really have a good answer because, you know, we want to switch over to renewable sources of energy. Um, we want to move away from fossil fuels that do so much damage to our environment, so much damage to water quality and air quality, and it's contributing to global warming. So we want to move to solar and wind. Uh, will wind have an impact on birds? Um, I mean, they have lots of wind turbines in Europe. There's, there's four or five wind turbines over in Brigantine by Forsyth, which is a beautiful bird area, tremendous amount of birds, and there's wind turbines over there. So I don't, I think, I think the biggest impact to wind turbines in my mind is actually installing them because you're going to create a tremendous amount of noise as you're in, putting in these wind turbines. And noise, we find out, is having an impact on a marine mammal population. So that could be a problem as we install the turbines. But once they're up, uh, you know, it remains to be seen what kind of impact, long-term impact they're going to have. Um, I don't know. I, I just, I'm not that smart to really have an opinion on the long-term impacts of it. Hopefully it's a net positive then. Yeah. Okay, Luke, do you have anything? Uh, I am going to, uh, well, actually, just to, just to add to it, uh, in a new port to Bermuda race about plastics and balloons, you know, they've started the last race. Um, they started a, a plastics and balloon location program where you'd report the Latin launch of something, and especially if a balloon had a, a logo on it. And it was amazing the amount of trash we saw between Newport and Bermuda. It's, you know, 500 miles, you know, out, out to sea and, and there's still garbage. It's crazy. But um, thank you, Joe, for your, um, for your time tonight. It was a great presentation um, and it was super. Um, so uh, you guys should see on my screen, there's, there's a uh, save coastalwildlife.org's website. Um, if you wanted to get information about them, you can also find out more information uh, about the Raritan Yacht Club by looking at our, our site, ryc.org, or uh, on Facebook at, at Raritan Yacht Club. Google search will get you there as well, or you know, feel free to reach out to you know, someone the way you found out about this presentation. Um, Paul, did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, I, I just want to reiterate, I mean, Joe, it was a great presentation. Um, you know, I, I didn't know a lot about what your uh, organization did prior to today, and there's just a lot of great work you're doing. Um, you know, I, I recommend anybody who's on here to, you know, let's jump in and let's help Joe out and, you know, uh, sign up and let's participate. You know, the water is important for all of us. We enjoy it. So let's, let's make it clean and let's uh, make it a better habitat. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Actually one, one more before we go. Uh, just the, the seminar that's coming up next week on, on uh, marine weather. It, so one of the biggest sources of, of information on meteorology, if you want to find out about seawater uh, sea, sea, um, sea temperatures, uh, seawater rise, currents, um, you know, weather, gribs, it, 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 there's so much meteorolo meteorological data for that we, that sailors we could use for route planning and, you know, race optimization, all that stuff. And, and the biggest site is, is, is our, is our um, records. And um, they have a lot of really good stuff. And we are actually um, in, in April will be the basically the designer of the website and a lot of these people have put that data together that will talk about what kind of information is up there and how you can access it and and how you can make use of it so that's that's the, the kind of the, the the gist of the seminar next month all right um all right thank you everyone for coming um i would appreciate it and um we will see you guys at the next presentation